Today, we're gonna get our carpentry on by making this badass wooden grimoire. Stay tuned. Greetings, adventurers, and welcome to Skill Tree, where we learn how to do just about everything. So today is day one of our new leveling system that we talked about last episode, where instead of leveling up single like individual skills, we're putting them under an umbrella that we're calling archetypes. Today's archetype is the carpenter, wood whisperer, master of the grain. What types of wonder shall we call? Actually, I do, I do know exactly what types of wonder we shall carve. We are going to be making a, a grimoire out of wood. I'm calling it a grimoire because it sounds suitably fantastical. It really, I mean, it's kind of an, an awesome notebook. Or it could be anything you want. It's, it's paper in between wood. Anyways, through it, we're going to learn how to, like, precisely measure and mark wood. Then, because we want to level up the skill kind of from the base, we're going to cut it by hand and learn how to, like, cut a straight line with a saw. We're going to do glue ups. We're going to carve with chisel and hammer. I made a very concerted effort not to use any power tools during this thing. So there you go. All right, without any further ado, let's jump right into it and level up this skill. Now, first things first, we need wood for our wood project. Now, because I was planning on actually like carving this thing, I looked up what would be like the most carvable woods, right? And then we've got some like butternut and balsa woods and all those type of things, which are great, but they're very, very soft. And I want this thing to be able to stand up. I'm going to take it to like LARP events or whatever. But in the hardwood side of it, it turns out that oak is not only really easy to carve, but it's really easy to get a hold of because they have it at like Home Depot and Lowe's. So I picked up this oak here that's a half of an inch thick by five and a half inches wide and 24 inches long. That being said, the paper we're going to be using is more than four inches wide, right? We're not making a little notebook. I'm making a tome of a book. And though they do sell larger pieces of oak, they tended to be really cupped, which means they kind of bend along that length there. But that's okay, because this gives us a great opportunity to practice our glue ups. To do this, all we're basically doing is taking some wood glue and applying it all along the edge that we're going to be gluing up. Then I just kind of used my finger to make sure it covered the whole surface. And just so you know, I did that to both boards on the edges that are going to be matching up. Then I simply clamp them together. Now while you're clamping, you definitely want to see a little bit of glue come out of those cracks. That means you had enough. If no glue kind of spills out of the cracks, you might have wanted to put a little more glue in there. Just make sure you wipe it up clean before it hardens. You're also going to see I'm adding weights to this. And that's just because when you add the clamps over the top, right, there's that kind of springing force is making the whole thing bow. So you're going to get an opening down at the bottom. Now, if you had enough clamps, the way to get around this is actually like clamp alternately on, on either side. So like put one clamp on this side, the next put another clamp on the other side, and that's going to even out that force. I just, I didn't have enough clamps for it. So weights it is. And once we remove our clamps, so now I have this working slab that's 11 inches wide by 24 inches tall. With that set up, I just go back in with some sandpaper and remove that glue line, making sure it's nice and smooth. Okay, so since this bad boy is 24 inches long, I can cut it exactly in half and have a foot for either side. So basically my little grimoire will be about a foot tall, you know what I mean? If it's standing on its end. To do this, I just measured this slab exactly in half and made a mark with my square, giving me two even sides to work with. Now, since I'm gonna be sawing this thing by hand and it's real easy to kind of cock the saw one way or another and get off of your line on the opposite side, I went ahead and flipped this thing over and made sure that line continued all the way around the board. This way, as I saw, I can kind of look on the other side and see if I'm like going one way or the other. Next, I clamped this sucker to my table just to stop it from moving while I saw it. Now the saw I'm actually using is this crosscut saw here. And just as an FYI, you can tell a crosscut saw because if you were to look like right down the teeth, you'll see they're a little bit off center from each other, right? They kind of zigzag back and forth. By the way, a cross saw does a cross cut, which is going across the grain. Whereas in a rip saw does a rip cut, which is going with the grain. And as opposed to that like zigzag that the cross cut saw has, a rip saw's teeth are just in line. That being said, I've used either for both, it, it, I don't know, it doesn't matter too much to me, I guess. I'm just not that advanced. Anywho, when you're starting to saw by hand, you want your first few strokes to be making yourself a little groove that your saw can sit into. So do this really slowly, making sure you're in line with the rest of your line. Also, a thing that's helped me stay straight with them before is you use your entire saw as the guide. So like as you're starting your cut, you're lining up the saw with the line, the rest of the line that you're going to be cutting below it. This just stops you from kind of being cocked to one side or the other. Now, once you get that little groove 
started. Now, once you get that little groove started, use the entire length of the saw. Don't do tiny little cuts. Also, don't push down too hard. The saw is gonna do a lot of the work for you. And if you're pushing into the wood, you're gonna get like fighting it a lot. And it's gonna wanna jump around. By letting just kind of your hand weight push down and go back and forth using the whole saw, making sure the whole saw is lining up with your line the whole time, it's actually really easy to make a very straight cut. And again, every once in a while, you can just check underneath on that line to make sure you're straight all the way through. Oh, one final tip. Once you reach the very end of the board, the last like little, like half of an inch of a cut, you want to grab onto the piece that's going to fall off and take the weight off of it. If you don't, there's a chance that it's going to like break and snap off. And then that little end bit that snaps off isn't gonna be clean. You're gonna have like a broken part on one side and some extra where it had broken on the other side. So yeah, just hold it up until it's all the way through. And check that out. Look at how nice and straight that cut is. I'm not gonna lie, I pride myself on making that nice straight cut. I love that. And it is really easy to do. If you don't have a power saw or whatever, you can totally still make nice straight cuts. And build up the biceps as you do like a champ. They're there, I promise. They're underneath the thing. We're gonna forget it for now. Now to really make sure those two are even and they're nice and clean, I went ahead and clamped them together so that those cut edges were facing up. Then I just took this little wooden block here to which I glued on some sandpaper. So I had a nice flat edge to sand with. Running it across both boards at the same time, make sure that they're both evenly sanded and any of those little imperfections from the saw are gone. All right, so now we get the length right at both of them being about a foot. The problem is they're now like 11 inches wide. My paper here is only about eight and a half inches wide. So I want to make two more cuts. I could just take it all off of one side, but then that seam that I have going down the middle isn't going to be in the middle anymore, right? It's going to be off to one side more. And that drives me crazy. I need it to be right in the middle. That's okay though, because we're just going to follow suit as we did before. Marking out our lines, locking it in with our clamp, and then following our line with our saw. Again, making sure to hold up the weight of that cutoff piece while making our final cuts. Then since this one is with the grain, it's a rip cut. Rather than using sandpaper, I can actually put these two things together and use my little block plane to make sure they're perfect. This is a nifty little tool. It just has a flat edge with a tiny like razor of a blade sticking just past that surface. This way you can ride along that flat face of it and take off tiny little shavings of wood, making everything underneath it like perfect and smooth. We'll definitely cover more into how to use one of those in a later episode. But now we have these two beautiful pieces of wood that are the same size, they're nice and clean. My workshop is filled with the smell of sawdust and it smells so good. I'm not gonna lie, I might have, I might have a bad sawdust habit. <laughs> Speaking of bad habits and the breaking thereof, let me introduce you to today's sponsor, Fume. I've talked about this thing before and I still love it. I use it all the time. Fume is basically a flavored air device. Now look at this, really cool. If you look here, when I open it up, inside, there's a little spot to put this kind of little stick in here. This thing has a whole bunch of flavor. The flavor I have in there right now is, I think, orange vanilla, and it is so good. So I can see this being super useful if you're trying to break an obvious bad habit. But for me, it's really useful because I'm somebody who always needs to, like, fiddle with something. And, like, I got an oral fixation. So having something I can kind of keep in my pocket and just on a whim take out and play with and, and like it's got this satisfying little clicky, which you know I like. Not only that, but it has a really satisfying weight. The construction's super nice. They also just recently launched a magnetic base that's specifically designed to be able to put this on it and, and you can like fidget with it, like a little fidget spinner. I don't know, they really kind of pinned down exactly what I like to play with. So that's kind of cool. So if you're looking to break a bad habit or if you're just like me and just need something to fiddle with just all the time, I would definitely check this out. The quality's fantastic. The, the flavors are great. Just head to tryfume.com backslash skill tree or check out my QR code here and use the code skill tree to get 10% off when you buy the journey pack. Just remember how it's spelled. It's try T R Y F U M dot com backslash skill tree and then just use the code skill tree at checkout. Delicious. Okay, so now that we have the little slabs of wood, they're gonna end up being the covers of our book. I wanna go ahead and start making a decoration for them. I really wanna carve in like a tree inside of it. Now, Maddie had made me this design up here. It's kind of a rough idea of what it should look like. And I'm gonna kind of riff on that while I make this. For starters though, I want to carve in a little border so I know kind of the space that I'm working with. 
To size this out, all I did was use the thickness of my ruler and make marks around every side, giving myself a consistent border to work inside. All right, so with that all drawn out, I actually want to go ahead and carve that in. To do that, I'm going to be using one of these little V chisels here, as it'll make the exact kind of furrow that I'm looking for. Just as an FYI, I'm using these like chafe tools. This isn't an ad for them. It's just the chisel set that I use. Ah, I show you, yeah, like this, see? That wasn't smart. But I got this from Amazon. It was actually really cheap and the chisels are really great. I'll leave a link to it in the description below in case you're interested. Anyways, to chisel this out, I just kind of put that V right in line with the lines that I drew and gently tapped it with my mallet to send it on its way. You're gonna notice as I'm going, I'm just kind of at the end of the taps prying up a little bit because that breaks the, the little chips away from the rest of the grain and lets them fall away. So I'm like tapping and then lifting, tapping and then lifting as I go. And here's the first really interesting thing that I learned while doing this. I was under the assumption that if I'm carving with the grain, it'd be a lot easier than carving against the grain. And though, yes, it is easy, the real pain of it is like if the grain wants to veer off to one side or the other, it either wants your chisel to try to follow it or it's gonna try to break off in that direction where you don't want it to. Whereas in when you see here, when I go across the grain, this is actually way easier because every time I, I went past that grain line, it just chipped away, which is breaking off to the sides. The line just ends up being way more clean and I was much more under control of my chisel. I just found that really interesting. I wasn't expecting that at all. Now, just to make sure my lines are clean, I went into each one of them and just kind of glided the chisel across it, not putting a lot of pressure down, but just taking away any of the roughness that's inside. Cool, so now I have that little box to work in. Now I want to make my tree, my work of art. Now, to do this, I'm going to be freehand drawing it. I'm really comfortable with drawing and I use it for most of my projects, but if you aren't as comfortable with drawing it, I would recommend getting something like a carbon paper because then you could print out a design you like and then you're just tracing it over that paper and then the image will be where you want it. Adapt and overcome and all of that. Just make the project you want to make. Don't let anything stop you. But if you're looking to freehand draw it, the thing I'm about to do does make it a lot easier. Basically, I take the halfway point, which for me is where that little join line is. See that? And I got a nice center line now. Perfect. Anyways, I draw a line right down that center line and then draw another one perpendicular to that, giving me an even four quadrants to work in. So the way this works is now I can draw all of a shape in one of those quadrants and then mirror it on the other side. Since I'm only working with that smaller square, your eye picks up the differences a lot easier. You're like, oh no, that's too high up inside this side square or something. Or this one needs to angle more down towards this corner like it is on the other side. You're basically drawing one side and then you're copying that side onto this side. I hope I explained that right. It really does make it a lot easier to draw. Using this little trick, I just went ahead and sketched my beautiful little tree. I realized it's kind of, it's kind of dark, right? It's like someone takes me after I die and carves a little person into me. It's, it's creepy, it's weird. Anyways, with that thought, whatever. Now I want to start carving the tree into the wood. So to do that, I, I don't know if this is the right way, and if you're like a, a wood carver by profession or, or whatever, let me know if this is correct. But the first thing I did was I went in with a, a sharp pointed chisel and retraced my lines, basically cutting that shape into the board. They have an extra like pointy chisel here with just an angle on it that has a nice little knife edge to it that's perfect for this. But yeah, I'm just kind of cutting around it. And the thought is that once I remove the material around the tree, when I get to that edge of the where I've cut, it's just gonna kind of pop off and not actually like dig in under the things I don't want carved. Now, this took a little while because I'm carving like every little leaf that I added to this tree. I was really mad at myself for putting as much detail into this thing as I did. Okay, so for almost the rest of this project, I'm either using that V chisel that I used earlier or this kind of more U-shaped one. I'm sorry, I'm sure these things have actual names. Anywho, using all of these, I first started by trying to kind of remove the background a little bit, which, you know, is fine, but I actually realized that if I go back in again with kind of that more V-grooved one, and I trace along my lines just like I did with the outline, then I never run the risk of kind of running into the bits that I don't want carved away. It gives me this nice little moat around my image so I don't have to worry about it. 
So I just do that first, going around the outline of the entire image, making my tiny little protective moats. Then I go back in and remove all of the background stuff, bring it all down lower than the bits I want to stick out, which is like the tree and the edges. Cool thing though, I found that using the, the chisels that are almost flat, none of them in here are completely flat, they all have a bit of a U shape, but the ones that are almost flat, if you really lightly go uh, against the grain, but not putting a lot of weight down, just let it skim the surface, it really evens that out. I almost didn't need to sand anything at all. That being said, for some reason, it didn't catch it. I did end up sanding it. I just grabbed a little bit of sandpaper and I made a little like, almost like I rolled it up to be a little toothpick o sandpaper so that I can get in between the little tiny spaces and stuff. But again, it didn't need a lot of sanding, but I did go in there and do that. That said, I didn't want the background to be completely smooth. So if you've been watching this channel for a while now, you know we've done a lot of leather work. And there's a particular stamp in leather work called the backgrounder tool that has all these little like little dots in it. And by hammering all those little dots into the background, when you go and dye the thing, all the dye sinks deeper into those little dots and makes the background darker. And of course, when the background's darker, it makes it seem further away, which makes everything else seem like it's popping out more. And I wanted to have this same effect. So I figured the best way to do this is to grab this little punch here and use it to make this kind of dappled texture all along the background. I just kind of moved it around in little circles while lightly hitting it with my hammer. And this did a great job denting that wood and giving me that texture that I was looking for. Cool, with the background all taken care of, I just went back into the tree itself and carved out those lines to give it a lot more texture and kind of round off the roots and branches to make them look like they're kind of coming out from each other, you know what I mean? And again, for some reason, my camera just hated every time I sanded. I just grabbed some 120 grit sandpaper and lightly, super lightly went over it to make sure the edges weren't sharp. That's all, not a big deal. Now, I want to get to staining this thing, but I wanted to add one detail first. I thought it would be cool if like the very corners of the book were, were raised a little bit. So to make that happen, I just cut these one inch by one inch squares from some quarter inch oak that I just had laying around. To stick these on, I just applied glue to the back of them, positioned them in place right on those corners, and then clamped them in. As you can see, this leaves us with this cool little raised area and an extra, mwah, an extra bit of detail to use. Now for a stain, I'm just using this dark walnut from Minwax, making sure I'm covering the whole thing evenly and getting the stain into all the little nooks and crannies. Now this next part is super important whenever you're staining something. Once you get to the back side of it, you have to actually fumble the can, make sure a lot, just a lot of stain gets everywhere. You want it just kind of covering the table on everything. It's part of the process, don't worry about it. Just keep wiping it off with your brush as if nothing happened. Now use as many rags as you can find and just kind of ineffectually wipe it all over the table. Again, all part of the process. It really has to be done in order for everything to look just perfect. Maddie, I don't know if you can find it. There is a moment where you can see the reflection of my face in the puddle of stain. And I, I'm not happy. <laughs> I'm just pleased. Oh, so all this stu- I didn't even hit anything. I was holding it. I'm like, oh, oh, no. Anyways, as you can see, it still came out looking just fine. Although it's all one uniform color, we don't want it to be like that because we want that tree and all the detail we spent so much time working on to stick out more. So to make that happen, and for once catching it on camera, I sanded it. I just took some 320 grit sandpaper and went over the surface of the whole thing. All of the high stuff gets most of the sandpaper and the pressure, making all that, that stick out, right? Which is great, because it brings my tree to the surface while making all of the cracks and crevices in said tree stay darker, giving it more shading. I also sanded just kind of the edges of everything to make the book look a little bit more old and worn. As a little extra detail, I added these upholstery spikes to each one of those corners, giving it this really kind of pretty look. Now to help lock that stain in place and protect everything, I'm just using this rub on polishing paste here. You just kind of work into the wood. It gives it kind of a natural luster that I really like. I kind of prefer it over poly. I don't like how shiny polyurethane can get. Though if you want to use something like a linseed oil or whatever, that would work great too. Okay, so we have like the the cover of the book figured out. Now we have to actually figure out how we're gonna how we're gonna put pages in this thing. 
I'm not gonna lie. This took me a long time to figure out, but then I realized I had all of these, these cutoffs from when we made the boards thinner. And I thought we could totally use this as a spine. So I stained one of those up to match the rest of the book. I also busted out this nifty looking piece of leather here, thinking that we can use it as a way to like attach it to the covers. Remember the covers have to be able to open and I didn't want to just add on hinges, which you could totally do. But I thought it would look cool if it had kind of this leather spine to it and the leather is what allows it to kind of bend open and close. Though we also need a way to figure out how to attach paper to it, right? So in order to make that happen, I just went ahead and drilled in two holes on either side of my little spine here. The thought being is that we can use some cordage passing through those holes and then through all of the paper to hold it into place. All right, but first I went ahead and I cut that leather so that it fell right between the little corners of the books that I had made. Then I used my wooden spine to measure out exactly where it would land in the center of that piece of leather and added some contact adhesive so that I can combine the two together. After like 10 minutes when the adhesive had set up, I just kind of put the two together right where they'd lie and made sure there was good adhesion between the two pieces. Now, before we could connect that spine to the actual like covers of the book, I wanted to figure out the paper situation. And I think I did a good job here. The method I'm gonna use, if you don't wanna go through all the extra stuff that I end up doing, you could just use regular printer paper to make this work. It doesn't need to be like sheets of folded paper. That said, I had originally planned to like bind this thing properly, which isn't what this is about. It's just super extra. If you wanna learn how to book bind, by the way, you can check out this episode right here. But I bought this big old sheet of drawing paper so that I can fold the pages and have like what I wanted right here, right? Like they, these will make up the pages of the book. If I can open them, okay. Like, like so. <laughs> Having trouble today, I swear to God. That said, I don't like the roughness of the perforations on this type of paper. So I just use my ruler as a guide and a sharp knife to cut my pages out. Then I went ahead and just folded them all in half one at a time and used a bone folder to make sure the crease was nice and tight. With those all set up, I clamped them, making sure the edges were as even as possible. Then I used the holes in my spine to measure out exactly where I would need to have holes in the paper. So then I just grabbed another one of these little cutoff sticks here and I added holes to the end of it. You're gonna notice there are two holes. One of them's a little smaller than the other. I decided to go with the bigger hole, that's all. Anyways, the whole purpose of this is to hold down the paper. I'm gonna push my weight actually into this and then use that hole as a guide to, to drill on through that paper. By using something like this to push down on the paper, it stops it from being caught with that drill bit and just kind of ripping up and shredding. By pushing down on it, you're now making it like a solid piece that you can drill on through. Which again is why I'm saying you could totally do this with printer paper or anything. As long as you can stack the paper and then drill on through it, you're fine. Or you could be smart and just design yours with a third little one and use the same type of paper you use in like a three ring binder. I wasn't thinking, I don't know. This one has been wonky for me. <laughs> Anywho, with that all set up, I just passed some cordage through the hole in my spine, through all of that paper, and then back out the second hole. Then simply tied it off nice and tight. Then followed suit on the other side, giving me like an actual little book. I was jazzed at how well that worked. A lot of, lot of high highs and low lows in this project. You know what I mean? But I was proud of that one. I like that a lot. Okay, so the last thing we have to do is attach our spine to the actual covers of the book. To do that, I just kind of lined up that leather piece where it'll sit on the cover and then drew a line there. This just gives me a guide of where to add in my contact adhesive. After sticking the leather where it goes on the cover, I decided that wasn't strong enough and I wanted to nail it in using some like carpet tacks just cause I like the look of them. So I just measured out every couple of inches and then went back in with a drill bit to drill out those holes. When you're nailing something, especially that close to the edge, you definitely wanna drill it ahead of time. Don't take the risk. If I had tried pounding those in and it split along the grain, oh my God, I would've lost my mind. <laughs> But by doing this with both the front and the back cover, I was able to lock this thing in place and make it look really slick. And look at how dope this thing came out. It is a book and it straight up works like a book. Look at that. It opens awesome. You can flip the pages. It lays down flat if you want to. And the best part, the reason why I made it this way instead of binding it in the traditional way is I can remove this paper. So like, 
Once I'm done filling this book or whatever, I simply untie my cordage here, slide the paper out, slide new paper in. I made ye oldie medieval trapper keeper. <laughs> I feel like there should be like artful dolphins on it or something. I don't know, but maybe that's just a 90s thing. Maybe I'm dating myself. I may replace the, like the cordage with leather cordage at some point in time. That might be like more on brand, but I don't know y'all. Leather cordage likes to break sometimes and rope. Rope is rope. Plus I can like, I can hang this by things, right? I can just put this on, on my belt. I can use both of these. I tuck these ones in. I can use both of these and have this hanging on a thing or something, right? Like, I think that is a feature, not a bug. I like that. Now, fair viewer, I did add in one extra thing that makes this special. So, while I was building this thing, I threw it into my laser engraver. It's the one time I didn't use hand tools, but you're gonna see why. Inside of it, I did all of the names of our Patreon members. Not just the ones who are current Patreon members, but every Patreon member we've ever had. As we're rebranding and kind of growing as a channel, like, we can't thank you all enough. It is all of you who watch this channel, who share it. And yeah, definitely the people who like pay our way, the ones who give us a way to buy this stuff and make sure we can keep kind of leveling up this channel. Buying materials and stuff is expensive and we would not be able to keep doing this if it wasn't for you all. So yeah, we're wildly grateful for you and now you're like part of something that I'm gonna bring with me to all of our alarms. And you know, if you're interested, there's still a lot of room on this side right here. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this project. I had so much fun making it. Now, if you like this project, please give us some of that like it love and don't forget to subscribe so you know when I release new content. Also, send some love to these members of our Discord here. They've been sharing their projects with us and look at how cool these things are. I love when you get to show me the things that you're making. Most of you are so much more talented than I am. It's incredible. If you haven't joined the Discord, definitely check it out. It is a community of creators and makers and just incredible people. Link to that in the description below as well. Make sure you stop in and give them some love. All right, I will see you all next show. In the meantime, though, keep leveling up, you. You made it to the end screen. YouTube loves it when you do that and is a fantastic way to support this channel. Another great way to support this channel is by joining the noble ranks of our Patreon members. Special thanks to our newest high tier Patreon members, Max Pickholz, Heather Landers, Joe Smith, Karen Bierman, Elise Q, and Wendy Tyner. Big apologies if I messed up any of your name. There were a lot of you this time. Again, we can't do it without you. Your names are already in the book. It's fantastic. But really, we love you. Thank you so much for all you do for us. We super appreciate that. If you like what we do here and want to support us, consider joining our Patreon link in the description below. Otherwise, you can click on one of these videos that YouTube thinks you'd like, and that'd be awesome too. I'll wait and flip through my book. So much blank page, so much possibility. Mm.